Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. One Minute Apologist. We interview the world's leading apologists to provide credible answers to curious questions. Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. My name is Bobby Conway, and I am here with Dr. Norman Geisler. I am so excited to be with Dr. Geisler. He is definitely a father to so many apologists, and so many people have learned under him, like William Lane Craig and Ravi Zacharias. And we're just going to take a few minutes and we're going to interview Dr. Geiser and we're going to ask him just some questions about how he got into apologetics and hear his story. And this is going to be an awesome opportunity for you to learn more about the man behind the writings that many of you have read. So it's good to be with you, Dr. Geiser. It's nice to be here. Of course, it's nice to be anywhere, but uh, it's especially <laughs> nice to be here. Well, we are just delighted at the One Minute Apologist to have you. I always love my opportunities to spend with you. And I just want to take some time to just ask some questions about your life. And let's just start off by asking you the question, how is it that you became a Christian, Dr. Geiser? Well, I came from a non-Christian home. My father was an ex-Catholic, my mother an ex-Lutheran. They hated the church, they had a bad experience with the church, so I was really reared a pagan. First time I went to church, I think it was a funeral, I saw a picture of uh, Christ on the wall and I asked my mother, is that Santa Claus? I didn't know the difference between mm -hmm. Santa Claus and Jesus at age nine. And then shortly thereafter, uh, somebody came by and said, hey, we're having vacation Bible school at our uh, church. My mother said, no, nah, you know, a little religion won't hurt him, and so she let me, she let me uh, go. And then they said, uh, oh, you know, we do this every Sunday here. And, and they picked me up for 400 times from age 9 to age wow. 17. I went at least 50 Sundays a year uh, before I became a Christian. Uh, they, they, they loved me. They were faithful uh, to the Lord. They taught me. In fact, just the other day, uh, one lady whose husband used to pick me up on the Sunday school bus, is still living. She's 101. Wow. Last week I called her on the phone and thanked her for her, her faithfulness, her husband, and all the other people picking this little brat up, throwing paper wads, <laughs> kicking the kids uh, next to him, showing no signs of progress for eight years, 400 times. The 399th time they came, I was still lost, and on my way to a Christless eternity, they came back one more time and I was saved. And what kind of a difference did that make in your life from that point forward? Well, by that time, because my favorite uncle was an atheist, uh, I was uh, irreligious, anti-religious like my parents, and I swore and cursed and told filthy stories all day long. So I had a very prolific vocabulary, uh, and it was very religious vocabulary, but uh, it wasn't good. Yeah. And when I became a Christian, one of the signs that conversion had taken place in me is I literally stuttered because I didn't have any good words left mm -hmm. to use. I had and, the, and or. All the rest of the words <laughs> were, were bad. And uh, so I literally stuttered because uh, God erased that uh, vocabulary from me and uh, took me a while to get a new one. I went to church and they were using the same words mm -hmm. in a little different context. You know, so it was hard for me to get adjusted to even mm -hmm. use the words Jesus and Christ and God because they were all used in a, in a blasphemous way. And I remember standing in my backyard when I was 17, just before I was saved. And for no reason at all, I just looked up at God and told him how much I hated him and swore at him uh, and cursed God. Uh, and God's looking down and he's saying, I'm going to get that little rascal with my love, you know. And sure enough, he did. Uh, uh, not long after that, I committed my life to Christ. So you fall in love with Jesus, you're 17 years old-ish, and the future for you is apologetics. Where does that come into place? Did you know what apologetics even meant, and how did you learn about apologetics? And I know that back when you were getting engaged, that there wasn't a lot out there. Uh, there was nothing out there. As a matter of fact, nobody even knew of C.S. Lewis at that time. Now, he had written books in the late 40s, but they weren't known in America, except maybe the Narnia series or something, but none of his apologetic uh, works. So I, I knew nothing, and uh, my father had gone to the fourth grade, my mother had gone to the seventh grade. I made it all the way through high school without ever reading a book, all the way through I read parts of books. Uh, and in the 11th grade, I'm sitting behind a student hiding uh, because they knew the teacher was gonna call on us. She was going down the alphabet, and she said, uh, Geisler, 
how did the tale of two cities end? And I said, with a period. She had no sense of humor. The period ended for me. I'm down in the principal's <laughs> office. That's, that's uh, the real me before I was uh, saved. So when I got converted, not only did I lose my vocabulary, but God reached down and said, you know, I'm going to make you uh, a scholar. And that's ridiculous, you know. I can't read. Uh, my language is terrible, and he's going to make... Uh, me a scholar, so he had a lot of working to do to uh, get me going, but some really neat people in our youth group discipled us. We didn't even know the word. They didn't use the word discipling uh, those days. They were just teaching us the Bible, but here's my schedule. The day after I was saved, on February 12th, 1950, that's 63 years ago, I was uh, uh, out doing street uh, meetings, uh, door-to-door calling, rather. Tuesday was street meetings, cold turkey. Wednesday was prayer meeting. Thursday was jail service. I met my wife in jail. She was playing a bump organ. I was preaching, but I met her in jail. Uh, and uh, then Friday was city rescue mission. Saturday was youth. You've been rescue. arrested ever since, right? Yes, That's right. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I didn't know you could backslide. I thought you had to serve the Lord every day, all the time, because that's what these people did. Yeah. So I thank God for them. But anyway, I'm standing on Skid Row. That's what they call the ghetto. Uh, in Detroit, uh, passing out tracks, inviting people into the rescue mission. And a drunk staggered up to me, and this is what he said, I'm a graduate of Moody Insta Bible Toot. Now, I don't know if he's a graduate of Moody Insta Bible Toot or not, but he grabbed my Bible, and he turned right to the page, red letter edition, he said, now read this. And I took it, and it said, Jesus said, go and tell no man. He said, now get out of here. Jesus doesn't want you to do this. I had no idea what that verse meant. Jehovah's Witnesses had just tied me in knots. Mormons had tied me in knots. And now a drunk stumps me. So I had to make a decision. Either I'm going to have to study and get answers, or I'm going to have to stop witnessing. Mm. So I decided to study. Boy, you know, and that's kind of similar to what I saw happening in my life. I became a Christian about 19, started going out to college campuses, witnessing to people, and they're asking me questions, and I had no idea what to say. And I really have come to say apologetics is kind of the Christian's task of loving the world with their mind. We owe it to the world to take time to study apologetics. What are your concerns, and what are the things that maybe excite you about apologetics today? Well, what excites me is it's a way of fulfilling uh, the great command there to love the Lord and your God with all your heart and mind, soul, and strength. Uh, and that's what I've been doing. Now, I was a little behind, to be sure, because I didn't know how to read. And I was uh, probably a C student or C minus student in high school. But God took a hold of my life. He gave me the motivation to study. I went away to Bible school. In fact, I went away to school for the next 20 years. I went to school. I went five years to Bible school, and then I went to university a couple of years, and then it was the seventh year of studying before I got my BA, and then the eighth year in MA, and then I continued on to get my PhD. So uh, 20 years later, after this kid who couldn't uh, read and who swore and cursed all day, uh, I have a BA, the equivalent of two MAs, and a PhD, and God said, I want you to uh, do apologetics. And you've written 80 books. Uh, just what an amazing well, source of encouragement. I am what I am by the grace of God. Uh, that story is uh, for God to take somebody who couldn't read. Yeah. And, uh, and then I end up writing 80 books is an uh, incredible tribute to His grace because uh, I, I not only couldn't read, I didn't read. And I still don't like to read mm -hmm. because I was never taught to, to love reading. I was taught baseball was my love, you know. And, sports. But the God gradually said, well, whether you like it or not, you're going to read and you're going to write. And so here I am, uh, 62 years later, uh, uh, with God's help, uh, we have been in 30, 30 countries and uh, written uh, 80 books, taught for 52 or 53 uh, years now. And I have students uh, all over the world uh, who have students uh, who are all over the world. So I've lived to see the second and third generation. God just takes these clay pots and works so beautifully through them. What a source of encouragement this is for the listeners. When you think about your life, Dr. Geisler, and you know, you're leaving such a wonderful legacy behind, what are some of the... Am I going somewhere? 
Are you going somewhere? <laughs> well, yeah. You said I'm leaving it behind. I, I yeah. thought maybe you knew something I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, you're going to go be with Jesus, right? You know, so am I. But uh, you have lived a, a long time, and I love what you said. You know, I'm going to rust. Uh, I'm going to rust out, not burn out. Or did you say I'm going to burn out, not burn rust out. out? Yeah, you're going to you're going to burn out, not rust out. And I love that. You're just going strong. You're still just you know what an example of somebody who's willing to really not just hang up their cleats. You just want to keep writing and keep serving and keep teaching. At the same token, you can look back on your life and you've got a, a lot more years in the ministry than I've even lived. And so as a young guy myself, and so many people are hungry to learn from your well, what would you kind of want to say? You know, what are the big ideas? If you were to say, you know what, if I had to give you four or five tips to, to being a lover of Jesus and to getting engaged in Christian apologetics, here's what I would share. What would that look like? Get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the lid. <laughs> That's what my teacher told me in Bible school, you know. Get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the lid. There's nothing you can learn that you can't use uh, for God. You know, I took some weird courses over the years in the universities that were re required, you know, like, like uh, arts class, you know. But everything that you learn, you can dedicate to God, and you can bring every thought captive to Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 10, 5. And so that's what I've tried to do. Learn all I can, bring it captive to Christ. Whatever obeys Christ, I keep. What doesn't obey Christ, I reject. Uh, not only live a Christ-centered life, Christ in me, the hope of glory. My, my life verse is not an apologetics verse. It's Philippians 1, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Uh, and that's the, uh, that's the story of my life, and that's going to be inscribed on my tombstone uh, because that's what life is all about. I love that verse. I've heard somebody once say, you know, if you remove the word to live is, Christ to die is gain. If you remove the word Christ and remove the word gain, you have to live is and to die is. You know, fill in the blank. And for yeah. the Christian, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Thank you so much, Dr. Geyser, for sharing your heart. I want to ask one last question. I know there's people out there that might want to get into Christian apologetics. Where do they start? What kind of tips would you give them? Well, I would uh, suggest to them that they uh, start by getting uh, in, the, uh, in the world and uh, witnessing to people because that's the real uh, motivation. And I have another little truism that I use for that. Even God can't steer a parked car. So get moving uh, and uh, do something that God will steer you because I've never questioned what God's will is for my life because I know he wants me to share Christ. I know he wants me to defend the faith and I just do it wherever he gives me the chance to do it. And I think people need to, to get active. You can't sit down and say, God, steer this car. It's not going to go anywhere unless it's moving. So get moving for God. Go out there, talk to people. They'll reveal the questions they have, then go look up the answers and go back and share it with They'll them. They'll sharpen you. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate this interview. Thank you so much. You're welcome.